All right, good afternoon and welcome to the ARC GAP webinar. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about our programs. Before we begin, I would like to go over a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who are new to webinars. So we have put everyone's phones on mute so that you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. We have many people on the line, so that does help to keep background noise to a minimum. However, this is meant to be an interactive experience, so if you do have a question, you'll notice a box on your webinar dashboard that says questions or chat. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the box, and my colleague Emily is here with me this evening. She will get back to you with an answer. If it is a question that many people are asking, Emily will pass it on to me, and I will go over it at the end of the presentation. So it does look like we have people from all over the country joining us this evening, so welcome, everyone. Our presentation should last about 50 minutes, and hopefully by the end, you'll have a much better sense of the types of semesters we offer here at ARC. My name is Margot Brookfield, and I am one of the directors here at ARC. A little bit more about me, I have been with the company for nearly eight years now. I started out as a trip leader back in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before transitioning into the office in January of 2017. So since joining the office, I've had the opportunity to direct a good number of our programs at this point. Um, and truly building and designing these programs and being a part of this has all been a true joy and passion of mine. So I've really enjoyed this experience at ARC. On the GAP team with me here are Emily Rosser, Sierra Durkee, and Alex Morton. Emily, who's here on questions this evening, is a GAP director and is in charge of our South, Southeast Asia, Western Mediterranean, East Africa, and Hawaii GAP semesters. She has led two global gap year programs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America for another gap company and is passionate about this field. Uh, Sierra is another one of the directors. She is in charge of our South America and Pacific Islands gap semester. She is a former ARC gap instructor leading our South America program a couple of years ago and also used to direct summer programs at ARC before transitioning over to the gap team. And then lastly, we have Alex is our, our third and final gap director here in the office who is in charge of our Western U.S. Himalaya and Central America programs. She is a former GAP instructor for us, having led more programs than any other instructor we've ever had with six semesters under her belt. So a lot of experience that she's bringing in there. We are speaking to you tonight from our headquarters in Bend, Oregon. We moved here about five years ago from our previous locations in the Bay Area, where we were for nearly 30 years. So this has been a really inspiring place to work and the outdoor adventurous environment has proven to help us create some pretty amazing trips around the world and inspires us daily. So we are a mom and pop type company here. You can reach any of us, including our executive director, George Hoke, simply by calling the office. So a little bit more of his, a history of ARC. We are entering our 40th year. Um, so our 40th summer, actually, our 41st year. So our first trips left in the summer of 1983 and were run by our founder, Lisa Halstead. You notice we call ourselves ARC. The R comes from the fact that we were originally called Adventures Rolling Cross Country. Eventually our company expanded and developed. We dropped the rolling but kept the R because ARC sounded a lot better than ACK and a lot of people knew us as ARC, so we kept that acronym. So originally back in the day, Lisa organized a small group of students with one other leader and packed a van full and leaving New Jersey, they were on the East Coast, and drove across the United, and the United States to experience the wilderness and um, venturing to various national parks and such and trying to really see what happens when team building, group dynamics, and personal growth are all put together in this outdoor environment. So since then, our programs have really evolved. We now travel to 22 different countries around the world, all while maintaining those founding themes and, and core principles that have made our programs so successful and really what they are at their core. ARC's mission is significant. It is to provide unique, life-changing educational experiences in places rarely visited and situations seldom experienced. I'm going to kind of go through each of these um, core tenets of that mission to give you a better sense of what we mean by that. So unique, um, I, in a lot of these, they certainly do go hand in hand, but unique in the sense that we do spend a great deal of time establishing relationships with people and organizations all over the world to ena enable these experiences for our students. We do want these programs to be unlike anything that a, a young person has ever experienced in their life. Um, you know, in terms of this life-changing experience, it is, it is not a tour or a vacation. It is really meant to be a chance to go places and see things that often people might only dream of or things that you might not stumble upon, you know, as, a, as your average tourist or traveler in this capacity. 
So this might mean, for example, like attending a Maasai wedding in Tanzania or helping out on a Costa Rican farm or caring for an elephant while in a sanctuary in Thailand, things of that nature. And so um, really meant to be these impactful experiences that you wouldn't get if you were just yeah, going through the motions or, you know, um, yeah, traveling as your average traveler. A big piece of this is the educational component of our programs, and a great deal of learning really does go into these semesters, which we will discuss in more detail later on this evening. But these semesters are about experience, culture, experiencing cultural differences and learning about the, um, you know, global issues that are facing various communities and working with organizations who are really solutions oriented or community driven um, and learning, learning also about some of those core tenants that we can also bring back to our li their lives at home as students. Like what, you know, what, how are they going to be as global citizens in the world and things like that. Next up, rarely visited. This does certainly go back to uniqueness, um, but just places on the globe that you wouldn't typically find yourself seeing. And a lot of this is due to those partnerships that we have created, which we also are going to talk about a little bit more um, later on. But, you know, really finding places that are off the beaten path and working with, you know, in tandem with communities that we've maybe been working with for a few seasons up to like 25 years for some of the partners that we work with abroad. So that does really create um, those those unique experiences for students and, and seldom experienced again, all kind of coming into one with that. Um, but that's a really important piece of our programming and something that we, we do put a lot of intention behind as we are designing the, these itineraries for our students. So more just general information, there are typically eight to 13 students in each of our groups. So this is a more structured group-based program, which is something that is important to note. And our purpose behind this size, we feel that this is really nice, small and intimate group size where you know, we wanna make sure that the group is not so large that students are lost in the shuffle or that we are invasive as a community when we are, when we are engaging with um, or, you know, going into local communities abroad. We wanna make sure it's not an invasive group size, um, but also large enough that there's a lot of you know, friendships and, and connections that can be formed within that. So this is the student's ex opportunity to have a significant experience when they get to know each other on that more familial level. And it really does become instrumental to the overall experience and learning. And for most students, the highlight truthfully is this group that they get to spend this time with. So another thing about our students is that generally they are age range 17 to 20 years old. So, you know, we do keep it within that age range. Most of our students, I would say, are 18 and or so and have just graduated from high school. We do certainly get students who've either graduated earlier, were young for their grade, or students who've maybe done a semester or a year of college and are now taking gap time thereafter. But um, we need them to be, that is a, a, our age requirement for the program. And we often get asked, you know, what are you looking for in your students? Like, what is a, a student profile or what are some of the things you're looking for throughout the admissions process? And I think the biggest thing for us is that our students want to be here. Um, we want to make sure that students are invested in this experience and want to be a part of all that the more structured group environment has to offer or this more educational experience. And so we, you know, we do say that we are not a therapeutic program and therefore we, we really are not set up to support students who are coming out of, say, a youth at risk or highly therapeutic environment. Um, but we are still, of course, there to, to support our students. We want them to buy into the program. And being that it is such a long period of time, we need to make sure that students are coming here for the right reasons. So that is why we have an application process that is complete with a detailed application, two to three reference, outside references. Typically, that is one academic and one character reference, along with a mental health reference for anyone who has seen a therapist in the last four years, as well as a subsequent interview, just to make sure not only that the student is the right fit for us, but also that, um, you know, that we are the right fit for the student, that we're what they're looking for in their GAP experience. Next up, the instructors. So all of our programs have two instructors who are traveling with the students for the duration of the semester. They are typically between 25 to 30 years old and have significant experience working with teens, working in an educational environment, potentially in the region that they're traveling to or if applicable language experience. This is primarily on our Latin America programs where this would be more applicable. Um, but they are very passionate individuals. They are motivating, they know how to run safe programs for young adults, how to connect with them on that important mentorship level. And they do really play an important role throughout the semester, serving as not only mentors and teachers, but sometimes big brother or sister or friend or even a parent in guidance and guidance if need, need be during the semester. We do require all of our instructors to complete a rigorous 80-hour medical training course, which is called a Wilderness First Responder, which is just one step below an EMT. 
And they do have at least 15 days of training just with us at ARC prior to heading into the field with students. So that's important to note as well. And, and you know, most importantly, our instructors are dynamic. Dynamic folks have a proven, um, you know, reputation experience working with ARC and that we trust are going to really help to make meaning of this experience for our students. Next up, I want to chat, um, oh yes, a little bit more here uh, just about the wilderness first responder um, and more info about the instructors. Next up, I would like to chat a little bit about our partners. So we are often asked, you know, how are you able to run safe programs in East Africa or Asia or Latin America, et cetera? How do you have these really intimate connections with the partners in these regions? And we feel it's important to note that it has been oftentimes many years of us developing and nurturing and maintaining the relationships with our in-country partners. You know, we have vetted them. We have an extensive vetting process that we go through for anyone that we are going to be work with. And we do working with and we do trust our partners to help create these really dynamic itineraries that are flexible um, potentially helping us to find other projects that we're working with on the ground that are going to be impactful not only for our students but for anyone that we're working with along the way and it it truly is these these relationships that make our programs what they are another thing i want to chat about is just safety um, it's so important to consider when you are sending your student on an adventure this long to think about, you know, what if something happens and what infrastructure is in place. I think it's really important to note that safety is a top priority for us here at ARC in the office. We do have extensive protocols in place to manage risk on our programs that have been sort of curated and developed over many years. As I mentioned, all of our instructors do, do go through that 80-hour medical training course to ensure that they can help to maintain a safe environment for our students and act appropriately in the case of an emergency. We do have a dialed infrastructure of safety protocols in place in conjunction with our partners at Cornerstone Safety Group, um, who are consultants that help us in managing risk on our programs. Another thing to note is that if a student does get sick or injured on our programs, our protocol is that an instructor always accompanies them to the clinic. You know, we make sure that they are taken to clean and safe um, facilities. We also make sure that families are kept in the loop. We do have an after hours emergency contact if needed and a set communication protocol in place between the office, instructors, families, our in-country partners and such to ensure that everyone is, you know, having regular communication amongst all parties involved to ensure the best care for the student on the program. Okay, so a little bit more about just the programs that we offer at ARC. We do have a few different program categories here. You're, you're at the GAP semester webinar. That is what we're going to be focusing on this evening. But it is worth noting that we also have kind of service learning and cultural immersion programs for students in the summer. Uh, so for 7th through 12th grade, we do have summer programs. Um, we do also do custom programs for school. So that is something where, you know, we might have a group of students and some teachers for a school, and we run programs um, in conjunction with the, with the school. Um, but these are just some of the locations that we travel to around the world. We have a lot of different locations that we go to. Um, you know, we have fall and spring gap semesters here at ARC in East and North Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe, the Himalayas, Oceania, and Latin America. So a lot of different options here, which we're going to go into in a bit more depth shortly. So what is a gap year? You know, hopefully you've had a little bit of intro to this, um, being that you're already at this webinar and, and kind of understanding what a gap year is. But Important to note that it's something that has been common internationally and has only recently picked up more significantly in the United States. It is meant to be a natural break between high school and college and an opportunity for students to gain maturity and perspective, awareness, um, grow in their leadership skills. It meant to be an opportunity for students to unplug from the everyday classroom and reboot in a way that is much more experiential. So, you know, something that folks can relate to and really get a lot out of um, and maybe reconnect with their love of learning. Students often get, gain a better sense of identity, self-confidence, and an ability to connect with more real-world experiences, the types of things that they're going to be experiencing as they venture off post-education into whatever life presents them with thereafter. And it should be an opportunity, too, in some capacity, or at least on our programs, we want students to be able to connect whatever they've been learning in school um, or in that more academic environment and apply it to where they are and what they're doing and use that going forward. Often we found that the gap year does inspire a student's path forward in college, maybe in their career pursuit, hobbies and passions, things like that, or just as important, helps them figure out maybe what they don't want to do. Um, that is also a very important learning that can happen on a gap year, because if you try something out that you think you're passionate about, to be able to sort of narrow that down prior to heading to college and investing a lot of time and money into a major on something that can be a really important experience. 
So within each of our programs, there is a framework that is comprised of five different pillars. So these are the pillars that really make up the foundation and essence of our semesters. So that is education, cultural immersion, leadership, project-based learning, and adventure. So we're gonna go over these in a little bit more depth here as well. All right, so within the educational component of the program, we do have six different global themes that students are learning about throughout the course of the semester. So these are education and literacy, public health, the movement of people, environment and conservation, indigenous rights and histories, and then social justice. So within that, the way that students are going to be, you know, exposed to those themes is through partnering with local organizations where they might be doing research or conducting interviews or like lending a hand and shadowing and joining in on ongoing projects. So students are working alongside, you know, community members or organization um, heads or scientists, you know, whoever it may be to gain a deeper understanding of what is going on. And the curriculum is set up to enhance that experiential learning, um, which, you know, everyone should be able to relate to as they're really immersed in that and seeing things firsthand. So throughout the semester, students have readings and something that we call a course reader, which is basically a series of short articles and snippets about each of those projects so that ideally students are coming in with a bit of background knowledge, um, you know, not coming in just as, you know, blindly to a project, but having some foundational knowledge to really frame that experience for them. Um, so they have some readings, they do have discussions with their group about all that they are seeing and experiencing and doing. And then the final sort of, you know, they also might have something that we call um, our uh, reflective field assignments, they might have journal prompts and things like that. But the final piece of the educational curriculum is the Capstone Passion Project. And this is basically an opportunity for students to pick one topic or theme that is of most interest to them. They sort of research that throughout the course of the semester and then they give a presentation at the end of the program that can take any creative form that they want. So we really want them to, to focus on something that interests them and something that they are excited about. So the hands-on projects as well, as I've mentioned, this is a major component of the semester. So we are, are one of our focus, focuses with, with all of our um, projects that we're doing is that we wanna work with organizations that are already established, you know, sustainably running on the ground, locally driven. Our students are really there to lend a hand, potentially bring resources, whether that be, you know, financial resources to the project or something like that, and, and learning. Um, we really do want these things to be a mutually beneficial exchange. So our students are given the opportunity to be a part of those projects and see what the organizations are trying to accomplish, basically. Um, so yeah, just lending a hand. Cultural immersion. So cultural, culture is something that is experienced every day on the programs, and it is why students take a gap semester. We want them to experience the things and immerse themselves in cultures they are unfamiliar with and broaden their own perspectives within that. So um, for our international programs in particular, we often might do this through home stays, group community stays, participating in daily traditions and activities. And this certainly does come into play in our, on our domestic programs as well, but it's a bit more prevalent abroad. We also have a leadership progression that students are, you know, progressing through throughout the co course of the program. Um, a big piece of this is students are taking on both formal and informal leadership roles throughout the course of the program. They are learning about various leadership styles and sort of understanding what their goals are within their leadership development. They are giving and receiving feedback to one another, um, working together as well within that. And it sort of culminates in our student planned module, which is about two thirds of the way through the semester where students are given a few, um, you know, four to five days, basically, they're given a budget uh, per person. And then as a group, they need to figure out where they're going, what they're doing, where they are staying, uh, what they're eating, what their, you know, activities, transportation, all of those things. Um, so they're, they're coming up with that plan on their own, sort of learning to travel in a more backpacker type budget, working together to figure out those plans. There might be disagreements, but often that's a really, really important and, and crucial point in the leadership development of, of the students. And so often we do get feedback after the program from parents that they see noticeably increased confidence and self within that leadership um, progression as well. And lastly, adventure. Um, you know, it is a gap year. We want our students to have some fun. So they might be surf taking surf lessons or going whitewater rafting or going on a multi-day backpacking trip or getting their scuba certification. So there is certainly a lot of fun and adventure that does come into the program as well. All right, worth mentioning just briefly COVID and how this is impacting our programs. You know, we've obviously been operating during the pandemic for the last three years. We did run programs in 2020. 
And this is something where basically we're telling families we are constantly adapting our COVID protocols based on the current climate of the pandemic and where things are at locally in the countries we're traveling to and things like that. So basically we are, um, you know, feeling good about all of our programs for 2023, 2024, and we will be publishing COVID protocols and guidelines as it gets closer to each program start as things are obviously constantly evolving and changing throughout. So those, um, that information will come to families a bit later on. Similarly on program, you know, we are still sort of maintaining um, that we are, that students are subject to whatever the local protocols are at that time. So we do expect students to be willing to mask up if a, if a partner asks us or if something happens and there's, you know, an outbreak in the group or something like that. Um, right now we are still requiring all of our students to be vaccinated for COVID-19, just the two primary doses or one if it was Johnson and Johnson. But overall, I think the important note is that we are, we are flexible. We've been running programs for a long time in all of these regions and more, and we are um, able to adapt our programs and itineraries as needed along the way. So we are constantly willing to do that, whether it's COVID or, you know, other things that can happen while traveling, a natural disaster or political unrest. You know, we are ready and willing to adapt our, our itineraries at the drop of a hat, depending on what comes up. A couple of things just about logistics around enrolling. So if you do enroll in a program, um, our fall deadline for, well, when you first enroll for a program, it is an $800 deposit to officially hold one space on the program. That is a partial financial commitment to ARC, so we do want to make sure that you are feeling like we are the right fit for you prior to taking that step. The deadline for a partial refund of $300 of that $800 for a fall program is June 1st. Similarly, for the spring, the deadline is November 1st. So if you enroll or withdraw before that deadline, you'd get $300 back, after which it is non-refundable. The um, Exception to this is if we were to cancel a program before it begins, you get a full refund or you're able to transfer that to another program of your choosing. Or if we for some reason did not accept a student into the program, then they would get a full refund on all payments made. So those are the important exceptions there. All righty, so now we're gonna dig into our various gap semesters. We do have nine different gap semester programs at this time. Uh, there's a lot of information to go through here. I'm just gonna go through highlights of each of the projects and the itineraries here, so um, bear with me with that, but this should give you a pretty good overview of the various programs we have. So I'm starting with our domestic programs. We're gonna start in Hawaii. This is a fall and spring semester program that travels to three of the Hawaiian islands, the Big Island, Maui, and Oahu. So we'll dig into some of the over, overview here. So on the Big Island, students are going to get to spend some time in Volcanoes National Park. Um, the Big Island is the youngest of the main islands. The students also get to see the unique ecosystem and recent lava flows um, that have helped kind of produce this island. So while in Volcanoes National Park, they're working with the Sur um, Park Service to remove invasive species, primarily a, a specific ginger that is in the park that has been um, detrimental to the local and native um, plants in the area. Students also get to explore lava flows from the 2018 eruption on the island, and then also visit Mauna Kea, which is actually the tallest mountain on the planet when measured from the seafloor, and stargaze from above the clouds at the top of this um, beautiful peak on the big island. Next up, we have our manta ray snorkel, as well as our scuba certification. So for the manta ray experience, students are doing a nighttime snorkel with manta rays to see them feeding. One of those very cool kind of once in a lifetime opportunities, um, you know, exploring the marine life in, in the warm crystal waters of, of the Big Island of Hawaii. And then students are also getting to do their PADI scuba certification. So this is for, for any programs that have scuba. This is usually a three to four day course where students are doing some practical skills development, usually in a pool or shallow, shallow water environment, and then doing their um, scuba course in the open water. An important note about all of our scuba courses as well is that you can get either your open um, Paddy open water or advanced open water diver certification if a student already has their open water cert. So something to keep in mind, you can do the advanced as well, which is a really cool opportunity. Next up, we have a food security project um, and remediation techniques here. So this is on Maui. Students get to spend time at University of Hawaii Maui College's experimental aquaponics farm. So we do have multiple projects that are touching on this. They get to do some permaculture and sustainable farming near YPO Valley, um, as well as, as I mentioned, the aquaponics and permaculture experience on campus at UHMC. 
um, and learning about both traditional and experimental farming techniques throughout the course of the program. This is a big piece of this, especially looking at food security in an island capacity, um, especially a state within our own country if you're in the United States. So really interesting kind of deep dive into this throughout the course of the program. Next up, students do get to do surf lessons, and actually students get, do get to do multiple surf lessons throughout the course of the program, but they're taking surf lessons here in Oahu's North Shore. And then they're doing also a, um, and yes, they do get to do surf lessons on all three islands, actually. So, and then otherwise, habitat restoration. So students are working with a local NGO um, to preserve the nesting grounds for the threatened lace and albatross on the North Shore of Oahu. So within that, students are also removing invasive plants, outplanting natives that the birds will use for their nests, as well as protecting the area from predators and things of that nature. It's a very unique dry forest restoration in the hills above one of the beaches on Oahu. And lastly, um, and again, these are just highlights. There's a lot more that goes into each of these programs. We're just doing the major ones, but we have our ancient fish pond restoration and organic taro farming. So for this project, students are working with a local foundation to restore and maintain an ancient fish pond that once served as a sustainable source of protein for the community. Um, they are also yeah, learning about taro and just its ex historical importance in this region. And then otherwise exploring Hawaiian culture and taking part in a traditional hula um, lessons and blessing ceremonies, um, which they're kind of doing throughout the program on all three of the islands. All right, next up we have our Western U.S. program. Something that I just realized I forgot to mention about the Hawaii program is that for both of our domestic programs, it is worth noting that we do have um, the students camping for the more, more or less the duration of the program. I know on the Hawaii program, it's maybe 60 to 70% of the semester, and on the Western U.S., probably I would say at least 70 to 80% of the semester, they are camping in tents. Students are actually also um, traveling by overland, you know, traveling overland by 15 passenger van. On the Western U.S. program, they do have a trailer as well. So kind of road tripping for the course of these programs. And they're also cooking for themselves. So students are kind of learning about budgeting and meal shopping and, and cooking for a group and things like that. So some really important life skills that come from this as well. Next up, though, is the Western U.S. program. This is a fall-only semester due to weather in the region. So it's only offered in the fall. But we'll go through some of the highlights here. First up, students are going to start in the Jackson area of Wyoming, um, so doing some exploration of Grand Teton National Park and the Teton Mountain Range, as well as Yellowstone National Park and a specific conservation project there. So within the Jackson area, students are getting to just do some okay, exploration on their own. It's the beginning of the program. They're doing, you know, um, orientation activities and things like that, acclimating to the program. Um, they do a one-day visit with the Teton Science School to learn more about kind of local issues in the area. Um, and just exploring the beautiful, you know, turquoise alpine lakes and such of the Tetons. And then in Yellowstone, they are doing a really awesome project working with local conservationists where they are learning about wolf tracking as well as bison and grizzly studies um, with these local conservationists and doing some naturalist classes, as well as learning about the stewardship of public lands, the history of Yellowstone National Park as the, the country's first national park. The, the you know indigenous people who were displaced for the creation of these national parks, those sorts of topics are covered. And then also visiting you know some of the uh, important landmarks like the Old Faithful Geyser and such, and hiking in Yellowstone in the Yellowstone area as a whole. Next up, we have our Wolf Sanctuary and Wilderness First Responder certification. So they are doing their um, Wilderness First Responder, or more commonly referred to around here as the Woofer, is what we call it in the Moab area while also exploring that beautiful area of Utah with some hiking and such. And uh, yeah, the Wilderness First Responder, this is the similar certification that we require our instructors to have. So this is a really cool opportunity for students to learn more about backcountry, um, wilderness medicine and safety skills and things like that. And then traveling to Colorado from there, um, students are going to do a discussion about cattle ranching, learning the importance of family farming and also um, you know, where food comes from. Um, and then Mission Wolf being one of our amazing projects in that area where students are learning about captive-born wolves and wolf conservation and getting to assist in various projects such as fixing the enclosures and just learning more about these animals. Next up, the group gets to explore a number of the West's most iconic national parks. So they are visiting a number of national parks along the way, you know, from Montana, as I mentioned, the Tetons and Yellowstone, 
also in Utah doing great sand dunes national park, Arches, Zion, the Grand Canyon. Um, so that is a really incredible opportunity for students to just visit so many national parks. And again, just learning more about that stewardship of public lands. And then students also get to hike the Narrows Trail in Zion National Park. Next up, we have our multi-day rafting and eco-housing build. So students are doing a multi-day rafting trip um, in the pristine desert landscape of the Southwest. Super beautiful. Um, you know, overnighting on the banks of the river, cooking out under the stars, all of that stuff, camping along the riverbank. Just a really beautiful way to get out there and see the world pass in a different way from the water. And then students are also learning about water rights issues in the Southwest and, you know, that being important in, in a predominantly desert environment and, and the sustainability around that as well. And then next up, they are joining in an eco-housing build where um, with an organization in Taos where they're learning about renewable energy sources. Um, they're also going to get to visit the Taos Pueblo Cultural Center and meet with members of New Mexico's Native American Community Academy. And then um, given circumstances might not immerse deeply in this, but it is an important topic to be mindful of when traveling in this region in particular. And then students also get to visit Bear's Ears National Monument. Lastly, for this program, we have our Borderlands Immigration, Sustainable Farming, and Scuba Diving um, experiences. So students are learning about immigration reform and initiatives on the southern U.S. border, a super important topic and, and something to dig into here for, for folks living in the United States. Um, they get paired with buddies and get to shadow them for a week at various local organizations around the Phoenix area. And then learn about sustainable farming practice on a permaculture farm in the Southwest. And then this program does finish on um, Big Island of Hawaii, where students are going to get to, that's actually, I apologize, that is where the sustainable farming project is going to be on the Big Island of Hawaii. And then students also get to do their scuba, cer scuba certification on this program, similar to the Hawaii program, uh, and with just relaxing on the beach, maybe some surf lessons, things like that to round out the program. Alrighty, next up, we're going to be transferring over to our international program. So we have our Central America semester, which travels to Belize, Costa Rica, and Panama. Um, this is a wonderful program, uh, you know, one of our Spanish language program focused programs as well. So we'll go dive into some of the highlights here. So while in Costa Rica, students do get to do a Spanish language school. This is one of the only um, more classroom based portions of any of our programs similar on our South America program, um, where Spanish is the language spoken throughout these regions. So with the exception of Belize, they do speak English, but students get to really dig into Spanish language, um, you know, do conversation based classes in an accredited language school on the beach. It's beautiful. They get to practice while in home stays and learn more about Costa Rican culture during that time. And then they also get to stay at a ranch in the Costa Rican highlands and just learn more about rural life in Central America as a whole. Next up, we have our conservation project. So this is um, where it differs a little bit between our fall and spring programs. In the fall, it is a sea turtle conservation-focused project versus in the spring, it's a little bit different with a, a jungle immersion experience. So in the fall, we're working with a really awesome grassroots organization that's committed to protecting all of Ridley sea turtles. The students are participating in nightly beach patrols, looking for the nesting sea turtles. If they see them, they might get to catch the, the laying eggs or you know, bring those back to the hatchery, or if lucky, see baby turtle hatchlings, um, you know, emerge and watch them, you know, release them into the, the ocean, a pretty magical experience. And then in the spring, we do a rainforest day in a Belize um, reserve, so seeing and learning about the work in protecting the endangered Hecate turtles. So still turtles, but just a different project. And they're also really focusing on reforestation and research with um, cacao, chocolate, um, what makes chocolate in that area. Next up, we have our um, the Monteverde Institute, uh, where students are getting to hike the trails in the Monteverde Cloud Forest and learn about sustainability efforts in the area, kind of looking out for wildlife, butterfly, birds, and such with a local naturalist in the area. Um, so really digging into conservation, and there is a lot of a wildlife focus on this program. And then students are also getting to take surf lessons, um, surfing, you know, the Costa Rican breaks, learning more about what we call the, the Pura Vida lifestyle. And then uh, they also get to do a multi-day rafting class, rafting trip on the world-class Pequari River, where they're kind of staying in a small eco-lodge along the river overnight. Super fun experience. All right, next up, this is in Panama now. We do have a rural community health initiative, as well as exploration in the Bocas del Toro kind of island archipelago. So um, our organization, Floating Doctors, is a really incredible locally run organization where um, basically 
they set up pop-up clinics in some of the remote areas of the Bocas del Toro Islands. They travel by boat to these remote areas for the pop-up clinics to bring access to healthcare to the indigenous population in this region. So our students are there assisting in non-medical tasks, um, but really just shadowing, learning more about it, potentially helping with the outlet forums and intake and things like that, um, and just learning more about the importance of healthcare access. And then just exploring this beautiful part of Panama as well. Um, since also spent an overnight and, and some time in Panama City, um, you know, learning about the history of Panama, Panama City and, uh, you know, yeah, the Panama Canal, things like that. Last up for this program, the students will travel to Belize. And this is where we have a really incredible marine conservation project where basically they're they, students travel to a tiny little private island off the coast of Belize that is um, quite small, where it is a research center. So students are getting their Paddy Scuba certification while there, as well as learning about um, lionfish as an invasive species on the coral reef. So not only are they getting the scuba, scuba certification, but um, they get to go spear fishing for the lionfish and uh, re actually remove the species. You can also eat the lionfish that you catch during the day and use the fins to sell locally sold for jewelry and such. All right, next up we have our East Africa program. Of the international semesters, this is the only one where um, students are camping again. So for probably about 60% of the semester, students are camping. They are traveling by overland safari vehicle. It's like a large converted semi-truck, basically. It's a really cool experience. Um, and also cooking for themselves for a majority of this program as well, as at times eating local cuisine and kind of digging into that. First up, we have our rhino sanctuary and homestay experience. So this is in Uganda, where students are learning to track and monitor rhinos day and night and help with rehabilitation efforts. So they're tracking rhinos from a safe distance with local rangers who are, um, you know, experts in rhinoceros behavior. And then they also get to do a homestay with local families and really dig into Ugandan culture here. Um, and they also get to go rafting on the Nile River, which is incredible, fun, big water. Uh, you know, at the mouth of the Nile, basically, in Uganda. So a really incredible way to kind of kick off the semester. Next up, we have a secondary education project where students are basically shadowing at a Kenyan, the first free all-girls secondary school in Kenya. So they get paired up to shadow with a Kenyan student for the week. Um, our students get to take Swahili lessons, start to dig into the language component of this, and then also just sort of doing its, its exchange. So learning about you know, the, the history that the, of these girls and how they ended up at this school um, and just kind of sharing culture and then also helping with like English language exchange, things like that. Next up, we have safari in the Maasai Mara. It would not be a, a trip to uh, East Africa without going on safari, of course. The students go, do get to do a three-day game drive um, through Kenya's Maasai Mara, where they're going to be looking for the big five, which is elephant, cape buffalo, lion, leopard, and rhino. And then next we have our solar power project. This is one of my favorite projects that we do at ARC. Not only is it a really impactful project, but it's also a great environmental project. Students get to do a full solar energy workshop, learning about what, what is solar, how much solar energy would they need to, um, you know, power their house back in the States, potentially, things like that. And then students, with the help of our partner, actually get to build and install solar energy systems from the ground up and install those in homes of folks who did not have previously have access to electricity and quite literally watch someone turn the lights on in their home for the first time. Next up, we have a public health project um, in Tanzania where students are basically just shadowing and learning about healthcare access in this region of, of Tanzania. It is a um, they're shadowing the nurses in a clinic that is primarily focused on snake bite wounds. So um, there is a lot of snake bite wounds in this region. Um, it's a pr predominantly Maasai area, so students are getting to just learn more about access to healthcare in the region, as well as helping out at the Cultural Heritage Center and the Adult Education Center while they're there. So um, a lot of immersion happening while they're here in, um, in this area called Mezzarani. And lastly, on this program, the students do get to finish off their semester on the island of Zanzibar, which is off the coast of Tanzania. And so while here, students are, you know, wrapping up the program, enjoying the white sand, beautiful beaches, also exploring the, the Muslim culture and the really significant history in, of Zanzibar in Stonetown. They also get to do a spice farm tour. So a lot of Zanzibar is known for its spices. So learning about um, growing spices and what spices they grow here and things like that. And just hang out on the beach and wrap up the program. It's a really, really incredible place to, to conclude. All righty. 
Next up, we have our Pacific Islands program. This is a fall and spring semester that travels to Sumatra and Bali, which are both part of Indonesia, as well as Fiji. So I'm um, going to go through the highlights here. We have, let's see, we have about four programs left after this one. So we're going to try to get through this and make sure we don't keep you too long. So one project here in, on the Pacific Islands program, this is in Sumatra. This is our orangutan conservation and rice farming homestay experience. So students are volunteering with a local NGO that is working to protect the critically endangered orangutan. So they get to go trekking in the Sumatran rainforest in search of wild orangutans and just learn about the you know, palm oil production and deforestation happening in Indonesia and how it's impacting this, this species. Then they get to do a homestay in a local rice farming community and just having the opportunity to compare. There's a lot of um, cultural immersion in homestays on this program, so kind of comparing and contrasting those cultural experiences in all three of these locations. Next up is Lake Toba Immersion. So Lake Toba is another region of Sumatra. Um, students get to visit this incredible, it's a, it's a totally different group of people that live in this region, um, the Batak tribe. So students go kayaking on Lake Toba and then they do a homestay in a coffee farming community. So this is actually, those are coffee beans right there um, before they, the, that's with the kind of fruit on the outside of them, that's what they look like. So learning about the coffee making process, um, a lot of folks have maybe only heard of Sumatra because of the coffee. So a really interesting kind of deep dive there. Um, and just immersing in the Batak tribe and, and learning more about their unique um, architecture, uh, their houses and things like that while they're there. Next up, we have our surf lessons. This is now in Bali. Um, surf lessons in Ubud exploration. So Ubud is kind of like the cultural center and hub of, um, of Bali. Students get to participate in a traditional water purification ceremony, as well as taking surf lessons in Uluwatu down on the southern coast of Bali. And then next up, we do have our social enterprise study, where basically, um, you know, the, the students are getting to visit a number of different social enterprises around the island of Bali. So potentially, it might be going to a farm to fork experience that starts with fishing at dawn, or they might be learning about, um, you know, a women's cooperative for economic opportunities, or we have a women's birthing clinic, like a women's health center that students are getting to visit. So a lot of different, um, I think one is also like effective trash, um, like waste management on the island. So a lot of different organizations that students are getting to visit with and kind of do a deep dive into. And then last up, we do have our coral reef restoration and scuba certification for course. So this is now on Fiji. Um, students are getting to do a number of different projects, basically learning about coral reef health. So coral bleaching and doing reef surveys with our local, you know, kind of expert marine biologists and doing some coral planting as well to try to rejuvenate the coral reefs. And then they are doing a scuba certification course as well. Um, so doing that three to four day scuba course, advanced open water or open water certification and um, rounding out in the beautiful islands of Fiji. All right, next up we have our Southeast Asia program. So this is also a fall and spring semester that travels to Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and dive right in here. All right, so um, first up we have our classroom assistance in Lan Ha Bay exploration. So um, we are partnering with a school that provides resources, training, and education to youth um, in this area. So this is in Vietnam. Um, so st our students are getting to shadow local students during vocational training and participate in other sort of like movement classes. Um, they're also getting to learn about the history of the Vietnam War, or as it's referred to there, uh, the American War, um, and kind of interviewing veterans and learning more about the significant uh, historical event that deeply impacted the people of Vietnam. And then they also get to visit Lan Ha Bay, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, go kayaking and sleep on a traditional, what's called a junk, which is a boat on the bay as well, which is super a super fun experience for our students. Next up, we have our clean water filter project in Angkor Wat Exploration. So um, this is another of, I think, personally, one of my favorite projects that we do, where basically students are getting to build and install water filters for communities that have not previously had access to clean water necessarily. So they're learning about the public health impacts of that, the environmental impacts of that. And these are water filters that last for up to 40 years and provide clean water for that long. So it's a really impactful and sustainable long-term project um, for them. And then they get to visit Angkor Wat and just, um, you know, one of the wonders of the world, super beautiful, watch sunrise at Angkor Wat and just kind of learn more about um, 
about the history here as well. And this is all in Cambodia, by the way. Next up, we have our Buddhist Monastery Stay and Muay Thai lessons. So students are learning about meditation practices. They're learning about, you know, Buddhism as a religion, as a way of life, meeting with monks who are at the monastery, kind of have dedicated their life to this. And then students are also getting to do, take Muay Thai lessons from experienced fighters. Um, so kind of a traditional Thai, Thai cultural immersion sort of activity for them. Next up, we have a nature reserve day and kind of learning about, more about elephant conservation in Thailand. So within that, students are staying at a nature reserve during this time with one of our amazing partners who has a sustainable eco village and, and teaches students a lot about sustainability within that. Um, and then they partner with an elephant sanctuary and they're learning more about the human elephant conflict um, while they're there, uh, you know, and how that's impacting elephants, logging camps that have been really detrimental to the population, um, trekking camps as well, and what efforts are in place to protect elephants and other endemic, endemic animals in Thailand. Next up, we have a Thai rice farming homestay and scuba certification course kind of rounding that out here as well. But for this one, students are doing basically full on immersion, learning how to plant and harvest rice depending on the season, living in, with host families for a week, um, really digging into Thai culture here. And then they also get to do a scuba certification course at the end of the program on one of the sort of islands off the coast of Thailand, super relaxing, a great spot to learn to dive and really round out the end of the program here. Alrighty, next up we have our second program in the, the Asia region, our Himalaya program, and this one does travel to India and Nepal. So starting with um, Nepal and some of the highlights of that section of the program, students do have time in Kathmandu where they are, you know, kind of orienting themselves to Nepalese culture and language. They get to do a, a Nepali cooking class and learn basic Nepali phrases during their orientation. Um, probably not gonna learn the whole language, but definitely, definitely um, you know, trying to get a little bit of a foundation to get by. And then students also get to explore Bhaktapur, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So learning about the history of the site dating back to the 12th century BCE um, and doing a homestay as well, kind of more immersion and digging into to culture here. We do have a Buddhist monastery stay on this program as well, where basically it's a monastic institute. So it's young folks who are learning the, um, learning how to be monks. Uh, so we're learning about meditation and Buddhism, similar to the one in Thailand, but this is more of a week long stay at a Buddhist monastery. And just again, gaining that deeper insight into one of the world's major religions. Um, next up, students do get to do a multi-day trek in the Himalayas in the Annapurna range while staying in small tea houses along the way. So um, multi-day backpacking experience here. So there is a, a significant uh, wildlife conservation component to this program with snow leopards, elephants, and sloth bears. Um, so these are in a couple of different places. The snow leopard project is up in the Ladakh region of northern India. The, the students are very unlikely to see a snow leopard. They're super elusive, incredible animals, but really just um, learning more about conservation of those animals in the region. Um, they are endangered as well. So we're working with local partners and specialists there. And um, generally, throughout these projects, discussing the conflict between livestock and wildlife protection in India. Um, down in southern India, then, students get to shadow bear keepers at the world's largest sloth bear conservatory and help with feeding the sloth bears and constructing enrichment tools for the animals. Um, so, and this is also a sanctuary for rescued elephants and learning more about their conservation as well. Next up, we have Delhi exploration as well as visiting the Taj Mahal. So exploring the bustling streets of old and new Delhi. Um, Delhi is uh, an incredible experience for all of your senses, sights, smells, you know, tastes, everything. It's an incredible place to spend a couple of days just exploring. And then and visiting historical and cultural monuments throughout Delhi, as well as getting to watch sunrise over this infamous uh, Taj Mahal and learning more about the history of this incredible monument as well. Last up, students visit, or kind of end on the coast of India, on the southern coast, um, surfing the beginner breaks in Goa with local instructors and just sort of rounding out the program, capstone presentations and enjoying that slower pace of life on the beach town as they conclude the program. Next up, we have our South America program, which actually is going to just be a fall program moving forward. It was a spring program this year for the last time, but due to weather, it will be a fall program only in the future. 
So some of the highlights here, um, so students are going to be exploring Peru and Chilean Patagonia on this program. As a note, we did have to remove Peru from the itinerary this spring due to there was some political unrest this spring in the region. Right now, we're still planning for Peru for the fall, but we will make changes as necessary as things get closer, kind of depending on how things are going in the region. And if needed, we will swap it out for Ecuador. So um, keep, keep, uh, keep an eye on the website if we are making any changes. We're happy to tell you about that different itinerary. Assuming it is Peru, students do get to go to Machu Picchu um, and kind of take the train through the Andes and the Sacred Valley up to Aguas Calientes at the base of Machu Picchu. They get to explore with a guided tour of the ruins and just learn more about this ancient civilization. And then we have our wonderful Llama Pack project, which is basically where students get to go camping in a remote high altitude community in Peru and learn more about the sustainable use of llamas as pack animals. Next up, we have Lake Titicaca and our Spanish language school. Um, so students do get to go kayaking on Lake Titicaca and visit the Uros floating islands as pictured here, which is um, which are floating islands that are made up, about, there's about 40 floating islands made up of dried totoro reeds. That This is also like an ancient civilization that was here even pre-Incan. So really learning more about the history of that civilization. And then they also get to do a homestay on the banks of the lake. And then they also, uh, while in Peru, do a Spanish language school, similar to what I mentioned in Costa Rica, students are kind of digging into classes during the week and um, bolstering their Spanish language skills. And all of our Spanish courses are broken up into beginner, intermediate, and advanced classes. So there's no need to come in with any sort of prior language experience before the program. So moving on to Patagonia, students are spending time in both the Aysen region of Patagonia as well as the southern Magallanes region of Patagonia, so two different regions here. Um, while in the northern region, they do get to go whitewater rafting on the famous Budalifu River, some of the best rafting in all of Patagonia. Uh, absolute turquoise waters, really fun rafting, learning about damming and conservation. And then they also get to do permaculture farming, where students are learning more about um, basically uh, organic farming, sustainability techniques. It's kind of an eco, an eco village that has been created to really live sustainably off the land and think more about our impact um, in our day-to-day -day lives. And then lastly, students do get to go trekking in Torres del Paine National Park. Um, basically, students are doing a five-day, four-night trek that ends at the beautiful tourists, um, the towers, and camping along the way, a really fun backpacking excursion. And then students are also doing an English language exchange where basically they are partnering with a local high school in, in Puerto Natales, which is the town down there, and just helping with English language and sort of partnering with the, uh, the English department at the high school for that pro um, project. Lastly, we have our brand new Western Mediterranean program that we are very excited to be launching. This is a fall only semester as it currently stands that will travel to Spain, Morocco, and Portugal. So, we kind of just designed this based off of our summer programs that we've had in the region for a long time and very excited to get this off the ground in fall 2023. So first up, we have our Spanish and Moroccan Arabic courses. So basically, this is um, students will be in homestays both in Sevilla, where they're studying Spanish, as well as Rabat, Morocco, where they will be studying Moroccan Arabic. So in Morocco, they speak a dialect of, of Arabic called Darija. So students are kind of digging into that a bit more doing immersive language learning in small groups at both established schools in both of these regions, as well as exploring those various cities while they're there. So um, really incredible opportunity to dig into. There are a lot of different languages spoken throughout the course of this program between Spanish, French, um, Darija, uh, um, Portuguese. There's a lot of different languages, so an, an exciting time there. Next up, we have our surf school, as well as our Saharan Desert Adventure. So students are going to get to do surf lessons on the southern coast of Spain, as well as do travel and trek into the Saharan dunes and explore this ever-changing landscape. So a pretty incredible experience. Morocco is on, you know, partially in the Saharan Desert, um, kind of one of those amazing once-in-a-lifetime type things. Next up, we do have a sustainable farming study and food waste project. So while in southern Spain and the Andalusia region, students get to live in an off-the-grid eco-village to learn about sustainable organic farming. They also get to see the largest concentration of greenhouses and learn about local efforts to pres preserve natural habitat, native habitats in the region. And then students are also doing a food waste project where they are Basically, it's an organization that's taking, um, you know, waste from restaurants, that food that's still good but was going to be thrown out, and then they're distributing that to the houseless population in Porto, Portugal. 
Well, in Morocco, students get to do a community stay in the high Atlas Mountains as well as a reforestation project. So traveling high up into the Atlas Mountains, as pictured here, students are doing a community stay as well as working on some um, local projects led by the community association in the region, which might include putting in sidewalks to prevent from erosion, because right now a lot of those are, are mud, um, dirt, and they turn to mud when it rains, so things like that. Also, students are going to trek into the mountains for a one-night overnight camp out. Then they're also going to learn about the inner workings of our Moroccan NGO that is focused on carbon offsetting through growing saplings of fruit trees and donating those to local farmers or folks in the region to not only increase with carbon or help with carbon, but it's also an economic empowerment tool where, you know, families might get a fruit tree with it. They can then sell the fruit of that as to um, help with their income and such. Alrighty, I know that was a lot of information. I'm just going to briefly go through a couple of the questions that came in throughout the course of the presentation here. So let's see, we did have a question about just the application process and deadlines for applying. I know we briefly touched on this as well as the, the process or deadlines for, for refunds, but in terms of the application process, basically, if you go to our website and click in the upper right hand corner of any of our web pages, there is a red enroll now button. It is where you can submit the initial application for any of our programs. Once that initial application comes in, we then um, do have an $800 deposit to officially hold one space on the program, uh, whichever program it is you apply for. And then after that, we do have those that detailed application, which is basically a series of short answer questions so that we can start getting to know the student a little bit better, as well as two to three reference forms. Ideally, it is one character and one academic reference. And then we do have a third mental health reference, as I mentioned, for any student who has seen a mental health professional in the last four years. We have a, an interview that students do via Google Hangouts with whatever, whoever the director is for that program. And then we send official acceptance thereafter. There are no deadlines for our programs. It's really all based on enrollment. So as long as there are spaces available, then, then that works. But at a certain point, there might be some limitations with flights or visas, things of that nature for the international programs. But you can always call our office to see what programs have availability and ask about any of those maybe more specific deadlines. Let's see, there was a question about food and water. So I know I mentioned that on the domestic programs in the East Africa program, it is primarily that students are cooking for themselves. Um, that, is, that is true for those programs. And then the rest of the international programs, basically students are, the food is provided by our partners or they're eating out at restaurants or host families are providing food and things like that. So, um, you know, we do make sure that students are getting clean, safe food while they're abroad. We also, you know, give them an orientation around how to keep themselves healthy and try to prevent stomach bugs, which is pretty common when traveling in, in some of these regions of the world. And then for water, water is either, you know, potable here in the United States, it might be provided by our partners abroad, or um, we are purifying water along the way as well. And a big part of this for us is that we're trying to reduce our plastic bottle consumption and our waste while traveling. So we also have students bring water purification messages or methods so that they can do that along the way. See, there was a question about what do colleges think of the gap year. I do think this is something that is really becoming increasingly um, accepted, if not encouraged, by, by schools here in the United States. So I think that's really important to remember. Talk to your schools that you're applying for. See if they are if they allow deferment for a gap year. A lot of students will defer their admission to the following year so that they can take a gap year and then not have to worry about reapplying or anything like that during their gap year. You, of course, can. Um, but a lot of students do opt for that option. Um, and I think yeah, a lot of schools have been really encouraging of it. Let's see, there's a question about speaking to alumni references. Absolutely. We would love to have you ask to speak with alumni references. They are the best resources to tell you exactly what to expect on one of our programs. Not only what the student experience might be like, but for parents, we can also provide parent references where you can then, you know, chat with parents of students who've done the program and get, get um, what their perspective and experience was for that. So just call our office and, and feel free to ask us for references. Let's see, there was a question about accommodation. Again, I know that we um, did discuss that some students are, they're camping on the domestic programs. For our international programs, students are staying in a mixture of, you know, they might be in a hostel or hotel in a major city center, or they might be, there might be occasional camping experiences like in South America, they do a little bit of camping when they're trekking and stuff. Um, they might be in homestays or other basic community lodging for community group stays as well. So kind of a mixture of all of those different things throughout the course of the program. Let's see, there was a question about if students do fall and spring with ARC, and the answer is yes, some certainly do. 
Um, with our fall and spring programs, basically students can choose to do one or the other or both depending on what it is they're looking for. So some students might choose to do the more structured group-based program in the fall as that might kind of set them up for success in the rest of their gap year. Some students might need the fall to work and save money for their gap experience in the spring and others or, or do some other sort of experience in the fall. And um, you know, certainly there are students who choose to do two semesters with us. So really just depending on what you're looking for. So I hope that you've gotten a good sense of our program throughout the presentation this evening. I know that was a lot of information, but if you'd like to learn more, there are a number of ways to do so. You can check out our website. We do have journal entries, videos, maps, blogs from previous programs. Um, we also have sample itineraries for each of the programs, which is a really great um, resource that you can look into just to get a better sense for what all each of the programs might entail. And then you can always call our office and ask to speak with a director. You know, ask us for those references, ask us any lingering questions you might have. We're always happy to chat through those things. So thank you again for participating in the webinar. I know how crazy school nights can be, so we really appreciate your time. Emily and I will both stay online answering any last lingering questions as long as you all want. And if something comes up when we're done, just give our office a call. Otherwise, we hope we'll see you for one of our upcoming gap semester programs. Good night, everyone.